Alright, hi, uh, welcome to this video which is on revision for covalent bonding. Okay, this is part of the O-Level Revision 101 package. Okay, so in this uh, video itself, we are actually going to explore exactly how our covalent bonds um, form and actually what elements actually allow covalent bonds to form. Okay, so a very quick recap. Basically, um, if you have watched the previous video on the ionic bonding chapter, I've already briefly mentioned about the fact that um, ionic bonds are actually formed between metallic and non-metallic atoms most of the time. Okay. So for covalent bonds, right, the good thing to know that is that they actually form between atoms of non-metals. Okay, so if you look at the periodic table, you should really identify which are the ones that are non-metals. So how do they react? They react by actually sharing their valence electrons with other non-metal atoms. And when they do that, they actually form what we call molecules. Now it's good to take note of this word molecule because it's different from what you have been exposed to previously, which is what uh, we call the ions. Okay, so ions are the one that has a charge that when you draw it out in dot and cross, you use a bracket, etc. to represent. Okay, and at the end of the day, remember that whenever um, atoms react, right, they are trying to attain a stable electronic structure. So all atoms, right, whenever they react, this is what they are trying to achieve, to get a stable electronic structure. Now, covalent bonds can be formed between atoms of the same element, for instance, hydrogen molecule. So hydrogen molecule, we all know that the chemical formula is H2, so what exactly happens for hydrogen mo uh, molecule to form? Um, in hydrogen molecule, there's two hydrogen atoms. So each of the atoms, let's just represent them as a H by itself. Within it, the electronic configuration of each atom is a 1, because they only have one valence electron. In fact, they only have one electron throughout the whole uh, structure. So the number of electrons required for them to be stable, because you're looking at the first shell, right? Because they have only one electron shell. So if you're looking at the first shell to make sure that it's stable, you actually need one more. Okay, you need one more electrons for it to be stable. And therefore, when they react together, right, you realize that they will try to share their own electrons with the other hydrogen atom. And therefore, the ratio of atoms involved is 1 is to 1. That's why there's only two hydrogen atoms in one hydrogen molecule. So how do you represent them? I represent them by this diagram. Hydrogen. We show an overlap to indicate that they are sharing. Okay, this is very different from what you are used to in terms of ionic bonding. Because ionic bonding shows a very clear cut of the electron being lost by an atom and moving on to the other one. Okay, but over here they are being shared. That's why you see the overlapping of the electron shell. Okay, uh, and because the electron is already being shared, there's no other electron that's found outside. In this case, for hydrogen. Another case that we can look at is when the atoms of different elements actually combine together to form a covalent compound. One example is water molecule. Water molecule is represented by H2O. So there's actually two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atoms. Now, how do we show? Um, water molecule in terms of dot and cross diagram. We actually show um, in this particular manner. Okay, take special note of the size of the atoms as well as the shape of the molecule. Okay, this is actually how the um, water molecule actually look like. It looks a bit like a Mickey Mouse. So if I fill it up with the electrons, right? These are my electrons dot and cross. Dot and cross. Okay, that is the electron that's being shared. Of course, the cross came from um, Hydrogen. Okay, and the dot is supposed to represent the electrons for oxygen. Okay, but we know that oxygen by right by itself, right, it should be 2.6. That means within in the first shell, there should be two electrons as well. So let's show the first shell, the two electrons over here. On the outermost shell, there should be a total of six. Right? So I've already indicated one over here, two over here, so I have four more. And this four is actually arranged in pairs at the bottom. Okay, and this forms the entire Mickey Mouse shape of the water molecule. Okay, so that's how a water molecule should look like. Okay, in terms of why exactly it must it look like a Mickey Mouse a band shape, you can refer to, uh, check with your teachers for more information. Now, before we draw down and cross diagram for our covalent substance, it's good to have a more systematic, um, scaffolded way of doing it. So, for instance, right, if you look at um, this page of your notes or on the screen itself, you realize that to draw covalent structure, you actually have to employ certain key thinking steps. Okay, number one, try to show the individual atoms first to show to understand what exactly is going to happen when they pair up. Okay, um, your job is to actually pair up the unpaired electrons, and then you're supposed to fill in the electrons in the uh, overlap space, and then check to make sure that the total number of valence electrons is exactly correct. Okay, but this might seem a bit abstract, so I'm going to show you using an example. Okay, I already went through for hydrogen, so I'm going to skip through hydrogen. You can fill it up by yourself. For oxygen, right, let's take a look at what uh, this entire step. By step instruction is trying to show. Basically, inside oxygen, we know that the formula of oxygen is called O2. That means inside there's two 
particular oxygen atoms. Okay. Each of the oxygen atom has a configuration of 2.6. Which means that to become stable, right? We are looking at the um, outermost shell, okay, which is the second shell. And in this case, it should reach a number of 8 lah, okay, to be a stable electron structure. So what is, what is the number of electrons that's needed for sharing? It's actually 2. And therefore, our ratio is 1 to 1. So that's why you know that there's two oxygen atoms that needs to be combined together. So how do we draw it out? Okay, to use the guide over here, right? Let me show you. Okay, first and foremost, draw the individual oxygen atom. Because this question is only asking me to draw the valence electron shell only, right? I only need to care about the outermost electron. So it's that means six for each of the oxygen. So one oxygen will look like this. Okay, I'll use the cross to represent the electrons. The other oxygen will actually look like this. Which I'll use dots to represent the electrons. Okay, I'm only showing the valence shell because the question asked me to do that. If not, I need to draw everything. Okay, so what exactly happens in order to know whether there's a covalent bonding or not? They are both no matters, so when they react together, it should be a covalent bond. Okay, how to know how to share? Basically, you look at the, the unpaired electrons, right, which is the lonely electrons, as what I say over here. These are the lonely electrons. They have no partners with them. These are the lonely electrons. They have no partners with them. So what we do now is we actually try to pair them up together. How do we pair them? Let's pair this cross together with this dot, let's pair this cross together with this dot. So basically, you will realize that um, within this entire structure itself, right, these two oxygen atoms, they're actually trying to share a total of two each from each of them. This uh, one at the top is trying to share both of its cross electrons, the one at the bottom is trying to share both of its dot electrons. So when I draw the final structure, I need to first make sure that there's an overlap area. The overlap area will help me to reflect how many electrons are being shared between them. Okay, and since I've mentioned just now, there's actually two cross and two dots, right? When I represent it inside, I will alternate the electrons to show where they come from. So it's cross, dot, cross, dot. Of course, you can write it in the opposite manner, dot, cross, dot, cross is fine. Okay, so that's actually the third step. So first step was I draw the individual atoms. Second step, I try to match the unpaired electrons. Third, I draw it with the overlapping area. Okay, and last but not least, I'm going to check to make sure that I have accounted for all the electrons. So if you take a look at the crosses, right? Inside here, I already indicated two of the crosses. But these oxygen atoms still have one, two, three, four that's outside. So I have to put it in back. Okay? And if I want to look at the other one with the dots, right? Same thing, I also have four more that's left outside. It's good to keep track of what's going on so that at least when you draw the entire structure, right? You know that you are not missing out anything. So for covalent structure, if you are very good at checking your own work, actually you can be guaranteed that um, 10 out of 10, you'll get it right. right? Okay, so how do I check my own work? Basically, look at one of the oxygen atom only. Say, I look at this oxygen atom with the shaded area. Okay, I should count and I should be able to ensure that there's a total of the maximum, the stable number of electrons around the oxygen atom. In this case, there's four crosses that's outside and within the sh um, shared area, there's actually four electrons there. So total, that's eight. So this oxygen atom is actually stable. So that's what I can do. Likewise, if I take a look at the other oxygen atom, and I count the number of valence electrons, right? Yes, there's four dots outside and there's four that's being shared. So likewise, this is also stable. Okay, so this is how you can actually check whether your drawing is actually correct or not. So that you actually have a double layer to ensure that your work is well done. Lah. Okay, so in terms of the structural formula, yeah, I'll explain a bit more later on, but I'll just show you this for now. It's an oxygen double bonded to oxygen. Why is it double? It's true, because each line represents one pair of electrons. Okay, each line represents one pair of electrons, which means that each line represents a covalent bond. So total is representing a double covalent bond because there's two strokes. Okay, because there's four electrons that's being shared within them. So that is what I call a structural formula. Okay, moving on, let's take a look at some other examples as we go along before we try out the assignment that's being assigned to you. Okay, let's take a look at nitrogen. Okay, I'm just gonna guide you briefly, then you have to finish up the rest by yourself. So for nitrogen, the formula is actually N2. Okay. For water, the formula is actually H2O. Okay. Water, I already went through it with you just now. So try to see whether you can use this step-by-step uh, -step guide over here to see whether you can get yourself in drawing out the entire structure. So rather than jumping straight to draw what I show you over here, right? Try to take your time to understand the steps so it will help you. For nitrogen, each of the nitrogen is actually a 2.5. That means they actually need 3 electrons to become stable. So the number of electrons that they have to share is 3 each. And this is a ratio of 1 is to 1 which means that you need two nitrogen atoms to form a nitrogen molecule. So, same thing if I draw it out in terms of just a valence uh, electron shell, 
one night stream will look like this north south east west north and the other one will look like this north south east west north okay so same thing i realized that there are some unpaired electrons the lonely electrons these are the ones that will eventually be involved in my covalent bonding okay, these are the ones that i will use it later on so how do i use them basically if i wanted to react this is what will happen they should overlap because these two nitrogen atoms should form a covalent bond and covalent bond is all about overlapping okay how many electrons should be found inside in total i identified six of these electrons with the star next to them so inside there should be six of them by alternating them cross dot cross dot cross dot okay then what about electrons that's left behind these two crosses here and these two dots here let's put it back in two crosses and two dots and she analyze this entire structure so you realize there's a way to check like what i mentioned just now if you just look at one of the nitrogen atom as well as the shaded area okay the the shared area okay there's a total of eight electrons in this case i want you look at the other nitrogen atom with the shared area there's also a total of eight electrons so this is a stable um, electronic configuration so everything is okay how do i represent the structure formula if you recall what i mentioned just now structure formula is supposed to show me how many shared uh pairs of electrons are between them in this case there's, since there's three pairs of uh, electrons that's being shared okay you have to show it in this manner and this is what i call a triple covalent bond okay moving on to water you okay, try this out for yourself but i can tell that the structure formula should look like this okay trying to simulate the mickey mouse band shape okay but I try this out by yourself and figure out what it should look like okay moving on to some of the more complicated ones now for methane uh carbon dioxide um, as well as ammonia hydrogen chloride fluorine etc etc right so in your notes so you can try to finish all this up by yourself but maybe let me just um, highlight to you some of their common formula before you get uh before you start doing so for methane right the common formula is actually ch4 okay so this gives you an idea of that there must be one carbon and four of the hydrogen atoms okay you can do the same thing on the left side by writing down okay this carbon need how many this hydrogen need how many so on and so forth or if you already understood the concept what i can do is straight away show me what are the individual atoms so one carbon should look like this how do i know it's four electrons i need to go back to the prior table to find out what's the electronic configuration each of the hydrogen should look like this okay they should be smaller in size than the carbon because they only have one electron shell okay take note of who are the unpaired electrons and you realize that this carbon right all these electrons over here they are all unpaired Okay, all these electrons are all unpaired. And these hydrogen, all of them are also unpaired. Okay, which means that when they form a bond, you need to understand how will the structure actually look like. Okay, and how will the configuration be like. So to give you an idea, in this case, because the carbon got these four electrons, right? This hydrogen each got one electron, right? What's most likely gonna happen is that the carbon will be the center that overlaps with each of the hydrogen atoms. Now you do realize that the hydrogen atoms are drawn smaller because they are really small, they only have one electron shell. But carbon by right should have two electron shell. Okay, let's fill it up with the electrons. So same thing we can check. Let's check for each of the hydrogen atoms. The number of electrons as well as the number inside the shaded area total is two. But hydrogen atom only has one electron shell, so the maximum is really two. So this is stable. Okay, if you take a look at the other hydrogen atoms, it's the same. But if you take a look at carbon, okay, total there's eight electrons around it, so it's also stable. So in this case, you end up with your methane structure in this manner, which has a configuration of CH4. Okay. Do the same thing for carbon dioxide, but just take note for carbon dioxide, you really, really need to make it a good habit to try and draw out the individual structures of the atoms first, to have a clear sense of how they are going to bond. First of all, carbon dioxide right, is really quite uh, tricky. Okay. Um, I will show the answer towards the end of the entire video. Okay, so if you want to try it out, you want to pause the video right now, you can do that right now. Okay, and try it out for the rest of the structures. Ammonia is NH3, yeah? that's the thing note. Okay, moving forward, let's take a look at the page 7 of the notes. Now, page 7 of the notes is trying to inform you about this thing that I call structural formula that I mentioned just now. Basically, structural formula, as I've mentioned earlier, it represents the number of covalent bonds. Okay, it shows you the number of covalent bonds. One stroke means one bond. Two strokes means double bond. Three strokes means a uh, triple bond. Okay. So of course, if you look at carbon dioxide in this case, right, there's two strokes here and there's two strokes here. So there's actually two sets of double covalent bonds. Okay. There's no need for you to copy down the structure of 
um, carbon dioxide from here. What you should do is really try to make use of the step-by-step -step, uh, instructions to try and derive it for yourself. Because I guarantee you that if you can understand this part, you'll never ever draw wrongly uh, a covalent dot and cross structure again. Okay, so what I'm showing you over here is just what some of the dot and cross diagram looks like. Just think note that sometimes in O level, right, we also represent um, dot and cross diagram in this manner. Okay, all this that you're seeing in this uh, second last column. Okay. You realize that the difference is just that there's no more electron shell. Okay, there's no electron shell, meaning to say that you just show the electrons that's being shed or the electrons that's outside. So let's say for instance for nitrogen, uh, there's six electrons here, right? So same thing over here, there's six electrons that's being shed over here in the same configuration. There's two left over here, there's two left over here, there's two left over here, there's two left over here. But there's just no electron shell. Okay, but do think that in the exam, right, please do not draw this for dot and cross, you are expected to draw something like this, okay, for dot and cross, not the one that is in the second last column. But sometimes in MCQ, right, they do show the second last column kind of dot and cross diagram. So don't be too confused about it. Okay, moving on. How do you get the formula for covalent compounds? Now, in the previous uh, set of um, questions, we went through ionic bonding. And we mentioned that in ionic bonding, right, the key thing to understand is that for ionic compounds, you need to understand what are their charges of the ions. Okay, so for instance, let me just read, do a brief recap. Uh. Let's say there's this thing called potassium oxide. We first need to decide, since this is a compound, right, we need to decide what exactly are the elements that's inside. And you notice that there's a metallic element of potassium and there's a non-metallic element of oxygen. So therefore, this must be an ionic structure. If it's an ionic structure, then the atoms must be able to form ions. So potassium, right, is from group 1. So potassium has this configuration of 2.8, 0.8, 0 0.1. Oxygen has this uh, configuration of 2.6 from group 6. Potassium actually becomes K+, plus because like what I mentioned, if you lose something negative, which is an electron, you become more positive. Okay? For oxygen-wise, um, if you gain two electrons, you become two negative. And how do you derive the formula? You do a crisscross method, or you try to balance out the charge. And this should give you K2O. But the good news is that for covalent bonding, most of the time, looking at the name of the substance, you can know what exactly is the formula. Okay, so let's take a look at this example, sulfur dioxide. Sulfur is a non-metal. Oxygen is a non-metal. Alright, so by looking at these two, I know that they will combine to give me a covalent structure. That means I can use this uh, category over here to understand what's going on. Okay, so basically, this tells me that there's sulfur inside and there's oxygen inside. Okay, there's sulfur and there's oxygen inside. How many oxygen? Look at the number over here. Or look at the word over here, di. Di means two. Okay, so in covalent bonding, right, or in fact in chemistry, we often use this kind of prefixes to tell us how many of the atoms there should be. So di means 2, therefore the formula is SO2, as you see over here. So this is quite clear cut. So even for instance, if we move on to something that you're not very used to, say, um, sulfur trioxide. Okay, you might not have seen this before, but from here you can tell that it's sulfur, there's oxygen, and because it's tri, there's three of them. If you like us, you can use this entire thing for instance, um, tetra, fluoro, methane. Okay, by saying that there's tetra fluoro, you know that surely there must be four sets of the fluorine. Uh. Okay, and if you um, learn a bit uh, more into organic chem, right, you know that this entire thing has the formula of CF4. But the F4 you should really deduce based on this thing because it says tetra fluoro. So these are just some examples for you to think about in terms of covalent bonding. Okay, last but not least, we move on to the physical properties. Now, in terms of physical properties, we always, always try to compare to what we learned previously. Okay, so I'm just going to write down some comparisons. Uh. For ionic compound, okay, if you recall, they actually have high melting point and boiling point. Okay, why? It's because of the strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the oppositely charged ions. So you need a lot of heat to overcome. So that's why the melting point and boiling point is very high. Okay, so that's for ionic compound. But for covalent structures, most of them exist as simple molecules. So simple molecules, right, are uh, referring to all these two and cross diagram that you have been drawing so far. These are actually simple molecule structures. Okay, like five atoms only, um, two atoms only, two atoms only, etc. etc. So these are simple molecules, very, very small molecules. Because of that, right, um, this actually results in them having very low melting and boiling point. Why exactly? If you look at this and that data, you realize that all their melting and boiling point is actually very, very low. In fact, in this table, three of them has uh, three of them actually have negative melting point and boiling point. That means even your normal zero degree surface, right? All this oxygen, nitrogen, and methane, right, will still be a gas ready by then. 
how do you explain that? We go back to the Siam um, scaffold. So structure, what is in between the particles, how much heat I need, and what's the melting and boiling point. So it's good to understand at this point in time that in simple covalent structure, you are looking at what is in between the molecules. So in this simple molecule structure, okay, what happens is that if you look at the diagram that I have over here, each of these things is one molecule. But if you recall from your kinetic particle theory, right, when you're trying to boil something, if for instance, this is for instance, a liquid state, okay, you see the molecules uh, being quite close to one another, okay, then they are able to slide over one another. You of course, I exaggerated the space in between them, they're supposed to be more closely packed. So if you were to boil it, right, you should form a gaseous state. Okay, and you know that in a gaseous state, okay, since this, all these molecules are diatomic, right, there's two atoms, right, most likely a gaseous state is also like that, diatomic, but they're just very, very far apart. So we are actually not doing anything to a covalent bond. What do I mean by that? Covalent bond is the bond that's in between the atoms. These are like my covalent bonds, the purple line that I'm drawing now. These are like covalent bonds. You see the dotted lines that I have over there? The dotted lines are not the covalent bonds. The dotted lines are in between the particles, in between the molecule. So all these dotted lines, right, that I'm showing over here, is actually what I call the inter... Because they are in between molecules, so they are intermolecular forces of attraction. So they are not the covalent bond. Okay? In fact, when you are boiling something, right, you don't break the covalent bond. You can only overcome the forces of attraction between them. Okay? So what I'm saying is that if, if you look at the gaseous state over here, all these covalent bonds are still inside. Okay? We are not breaking the covalent bond. All you are doing is actually you are trying to weaken this intermolecular force of attraction so that the molecules can be further apart. That is your job when you are doing boiling, etc. To make sure that the intermolecular force of attraction is weaker. So because there exists weak intermolecular force of attraction, less heat is required to overcome them. Or you have lower melting point and boiling point, right? So this is what we explain in terms of why covalent structure tends to have low melting point and boiling point. Alright? So this is in terms of simple molecular structures. Um, second thing, for ionic structure, uh, sorry, for covalent structure, right, they are all poor conductor of electricity in all states. If you compare this with ionic bonding, okay, for ionic structure, they conduct in molten or aqueous state only. Okay, but they cannot conduct in solid state because there's no free moving ions. But for covalent, right, regardless of what's the state, you cannot conduct at all. Okay? Why? Because in the entire covalent structure, right, all the electrons are being used up in bonding. That's why we all try to pair up the unpaired electrons. We try to pair them up. Hence, there are no free moving electrons that can allow you to conduct electricity. Okay, therefore, they are poor conductors of electricity. Okay, there's just some exception. Please take, take your time to go and read through this set of notes. And for the last part, in terms of solubility, most of them are insoluble in water, but soluble in organic solvent. Okay, what exactly are organic solvent? When you go through organic chemistry, we'll talk more about this. Alright, so this is just a brief recap for your um, covalent bonding itself. If not, what you're going to do now is that if you take a look at your notes itself, right, there are still some blanks. Try to finish it up, okay, complete the entire thing. Okay, the structure for carbon dioxide should actually be... Okay, I hope you have already done it. Huh? If not, you can pause the video right now. Okay, do you get it right? If you got it right and you are done with this set of notes, then you can proceed on to start with the assignment that's been assigned to you. If not, that's all. Thanks.